Thank you for joining me here today. Um, so I just wanted to maybe go back to the beginning and to for you to share with us your earliest memories, really, of Alistair, what it was like growing up with him. Yeah, fine. Um, earliest memories. Um, during the war, Alistair, my mother and I left Glasgow to avoid the bombing. Um, and after a few months I think in a converted bus we finished up in a flat in Stonehouse in Lanarkshire and really that was when Alasdair started school so he must have been five so I'd be three and that's when he became a person for me. Um, we used to escort him across the road and see him into the school gates and at playtime as I recall we used to go across with his piece mm -hmm. so he'd something to eat during the, the playtime the flat I remember as being cold, dark, dismal, outside toilet, down outside stairs and across the yard to the toilet. And Alistair managed to catch whooping cough, which he then passed on to me, chicken pox, which he then passed on to me, and measles, which he then passed on to me. So my poor mother had us in this flat. We spent a lot of time together in the box bed mm -hmm. off the living room. So that was my earliest memories really of Alice Dare. But then much must have been to my mother's delight. My father got a job as a manager in the munis munitions workers um, hostel down in Weatherby in Yorkshire. And we moved from this flat down to a bungalow that was near the countryside, it backed onto a field and I think the next four years were possibly the, the happiest in the Raleigh or in the Gray family. Um, Alice Dare's growing up was very difficult. Growing up with him was difficult, but he was worse than me because he suffered from asthma, eczema, nightmares, panic attacks, and his vivid imagination didn't help. He was bullied at school. So really he needed a lot of attention from my mother. So I just floated along in his wake. Mm. Um, and you, can I go back to, you were saying when you were yes. just in Weatherby, you were saying that some of the happiest times in your house, was that something mm. to do with being in the countryside and that connection with nature and Alistair being outside and being healthier in, in that kind of environment or what, what would I, you say? I think it's one because there were no financial worries because mm -hmm. my dad had a, had a good job. Um, my mother had some help in the house, which was provided due to the hostel. Alistair and I had freedom. Mm -hmm. We could go outside whenever we, we wanted. We had a lot more freedom there. We walked to school together. We played together. We had good times together and as a family. Um, so I think it was just, I mean, when I think of it, I mean, this is during the war. <laughs> Alistair was much more aware of the war than I was. That was why he, he had the nightmares. And we would go and watch the airplanes going across to Germany or Europe. And they'd leave in the evening to drop their bombs over there. And we'd count them coming back. And all this was going on, but actually, in my little life anyway, it was, it was happy and it was peaceful. And I remember them as, as happy times. Mm -hmm. um, it was when we, Alasdair lived in his imagination. I was quite happy with life as it was, so I didn't need an imagination. I had his imagination to keep me going as well. But- And did he- engage you in that world that he was kind of creating where you sort of eventually or I remember it more when we got back to Glasgow there was one incident in Weatherby which I think kind of illustrates our characteristics and why life got much more volatile and much more difficult when we returned up to Glasgow to the flat 
because while we were in Weatherby, I was sent, I don't know by whom, a very big straw hat. It was a lovely with embroidery on it. And I brought my friend back from school to show her this hat. Alastair was in the bungalow before me. He would not let me in to get the hat. It was too good to come outside. He shouted at me. But he went and got it and he held it up in front of the window. I, who was so angry and frustrated, just pushed my hand right through the window, blood everywhere. I mean, we were both in trouble then. I don't quite remember, possibly didn't want to remember what happened after all that. But I think it showed that at times, Alice Dare came the big brother, wanted to be superior, maybe because he was bullied at school. It was nice having a little sister that he could be dominant on. And my only way of dealing with Alice Dare was physical because mm -hmm. he could beat me with words mm -hmm. every time. Yeah. But, so I would lamb out. So when we went back to Glasgow into the flat there, and my dad was unemployed. There were worries with the parents, obviously. Alistair always said that was when we started competing for, more, for warmth, mm -hmm. for space, and for love. Mm -hmm. We were in competition then. Mm -hmm. But, and that, yeah, Glasgow was, um, it was a difficult time. It was a difficult time. And it varied as we went on. Whenever I, I think we went our own ways, really, in, in Glasgow when we were older teenagers. Whenever I, he was at art school and I eventually went to Dunfermline College of Physical Education because the only thing I was better at Alistair at <laughs> were physical things. So that was all that was left for me to do. And that was when we became very good friends and this caring, loving, companionable relationship grew up until which lasted until he died actually but yes the Glasgow the Glasgow um ones were were interesting yeah and I, I mean I guess at that time he was starting to map out ideas for Lanark wasn't he oh. do you remember yeah. that or what do you remember in terms of him because you know he he's uh, spoken a lot right about the formative experience of books on him as a, a child, not only going to the library, but obviously you had books and access to them in, in your house too. But it, I got the impression of him being his head stuck in this book, his big imagination, <laughs> trying to draw and wrangle these worlds around him. And like, what was he, was he, you know, producing a lot, drawing a lot, writing? What do you remember? Was he? Yes, he was. Yeah. He was with his stories and pictures. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever I think of Alice Day with his writing and his pictures, again, they were happy times. They were happy times. I, I must read you this bit from End Notes. Um, you know, in every, sto every short story, there's End Notes. And this is what Alice Day wrote. Maura did not interest me as a person, being two years younger and a girl. But until I was 13 or more, I needed her as much as I have needed a public for my books. So I was necessary to him. Mm -hmm. He tried his writing out on me. He did, as he says in Lamech, that is completely true. Mm -hmm. He was in one bedroom, I was in the other bedroom, and he shouted the bedtime stories through to me. I didn't need to bother to read. Alasdair shouted the bed. He got very angry with me the next day because I'd fallen asleep and he was still all his words were being ignored because I'd fallen asleep and, and I was in trouble the next day where he'd got to try and find out where to start again. So he also, with, with the drawing, he, my mother had um, an old autograph book, big autograph book, which she gave Alice Dare to draw in. And Alice Dare eventually gave it to me and he illustrated the stories that he told me in this book. There were floating islands, there was Wobble, the Di Diplodocus, who had all sorts of adventures. And these were illustrated in that book. Unfortunately, and very much to my regret, that book had a bad ending. Alice Day wrote in one of his letters later on, do you remember a picture in that funny album I gave you when we were in our early teens? The album with the finger ink stain in the middle of each page, which I did out of spite 
during one of our quarrels. NB, note, the blend of sad sadism and masochism in that gesture, I damaged your present by damaging my work. So that is him, his memory of it. <laughs> Neither of us can then remember what happened to that poor old album. Mm -hmm. But yes, that was his, his starting. I mean, he always wanted to write and illustrate. That's all he ever wanted to do. And you were always um, blind, right? The connection between the word and image was there from the start, right? It wasn't like you're saying, if he was illustrating the stories that he was narrating. No, there was were, separation, right? They were always together. No, they were always both there. I remember his, um, when he went to art school, excuse me, um, and I remember him doing his homework and his painting um, there. And he, he managed to save one of his works, um, his picture of Tam Shanter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. Because once he'd finished that, my father criticized it and Alasdair was just going to rip it up. Mm -hmm. So I managed to stop him doing that and actually eventually gave it to my husband, Bert and I as a wedding present. So we've still got Tam Shanter here, which is yeah. a joy. Yeah. I don't remember him saying anything about Lanark. Mm -hmm. But he did write to me, again, he, he was great with letters, but he never put the date on, or he seldom put the date on. But if this is one of his letters um, from him, about, and it does mention Lanark. However, I had more, I think Inga and Andrew had gone on holiday. However, I had more time to concentrate on my work. By the end of a fortnight, I had bought and begun reading several new books which were helping me to think clearly about parts of the tan tan -ta great book that I'm writing. Actually, I've been writing it for years, since I was 18, in fact. And yes, I will get it finished soon, by 1974 or 75, <laughs> at the latest. Three, three chapters of it have been published in a literary magazine up here. And as a result, together with something on radio and regular exhibiting, I have become a fusty wee Scottish celebrity, which is soothing. <laughs> <laughs> is it that just Alice Day? Yeah, it is, and it also was... that idea of deadlines, right? Even from an early stage, oh. by, at least by 1974, 75. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> and in other letters that it came through. But yes, I mean, I remember he was, he was just very good with words and very good with, he just loved them. He loved them. So did you, were you um, privy to any sections of Lanark before it was published or when it was no. finally published? Was that your first opportunity no. to see what he did? No, that, that was when the, the first time... I mean, I was aware all the way through that it was happening because in his letters he would say it might be published this time, this time, whatever. When did you first read Lanark then? Was that after it was oh, published? Yes, yeah. it was after it was published. It was when it when it um, it felt came through the door on the 18th, is it? I've got it written down somewhere. Sharing Lanark, no. I was in Stevenage. I mean, I was 44 years of age. I had two teenage, or both teenagers' daughters. And this came through the door and I read it. Here we are, I'm trying to find where I've written it. Oh dear, here we go, here we are. Um, I read it in four days. It, 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 was, it was just, actually, I don't know if it's worthwhile, Sorsha. I kept a, a journal in my days. Same. And I've actually, I can read from the journal what oh, I- privilege more, I'd love that. Would that be all right? Absolutely, please do. Because probably it was written when my memories were bright. Here we are. Uh, it was written on the 22nd of February, 1981. Last Wednesday, Lanark arrived through the door and I have now read it. On Tuesday evening, Tracy and I uh, head for Glasgow and Katrina joins us for the ce launching celebrations how I pray that many, many people read Lanark and like it and cannot put it down just as I couldn't. I realize I cannot give an objective criticism of the book. I only know how I felt as I read it. I wanted to know what happened to the hero and how everything would turn out for him. 
I objected to putting the book down to go to bed, work, etc., and was very pleased to find that it was so easy to read and understand. I probably missed the deeper meanings, but I'm not sure that it matters. A book should appeal to all kinds of readers. I am a simple one. I found it very upsetting to find out how unhappy Alasdair had been as a child and how thoughtless I was. I kept realising who Alasdair was writing about and got fact and fiction muddled up. I cried so much when my mum died and was so sorry that I had not made life more bearable for Alasdair. He seemed to have so few people who understood his problems, worries and longings. I do not think my mother would have enjoyed this book. I'm not sure that I did. It's not a happy book. I found that every word seemed necessary and only once did anything jar. When dad and I were supposed to be going to Zermatt climbing. Sky, yes. Zermatt, no. I also wonder how it must feel to open yourself completely to the world, to anyone who wants to read the book. It must make one feel very naked and vulnerable. And I wonder if it was done to finally make a mark on all those people who had ignored him or not given him the attention he thought he deserved. Wow, what an entry, Mark. That's amazing. And mm. I mean, obviously, it's a hard book for you to read too, because you can see that obviously the autobiographical element, not just of Alice yeah. and what he was struggling with, but I mm. probably you and your, your, your parents too. So, yes, books. Books two and three are the ones that I identify most with. But I'm, I'm reading Lanark again. I think this is my fourth time. And even in the other books, there's, there's sections which you think, yeah, that's just what my dad would do, or that's just what, yeah, there's, it comes through all the way yeah. through. And yes, it's, um, it's quite an emotional book to read. I can imagine. But so are some of his others, but I think that's the most, that's the most, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What, but, but, yeah. But you talk about that then, his almost his motivation for working on that, and in some way that acknowledgement that I guess you're saying was lacking for many people as as a boy with him growing up, being bullied, being sort of sickly, and that um, need to um, to have some sort of love or recognition in a way. Yes. Well, he felt he felt unloved and unlovable. Mm -hmm. He knew my mother loved him, mm -hmm. but I mean, Alice Day was such a Oh, my mother and father at times must both have wondered what have we brought into this world I mean if you remember the bit and this this was the bit in Lanark I absolutely hated um the bit where Alice Dare is not eating yes it's hard oh, yeah. it, God. I mean and meal meal times were fraught yeah. not just Alice Dare me as well and it was always, you know, your mother's done this and there's children starving in China and there's, and Alice Day would, I mean, I wouldn't get into the state Alice Day would get into about the food. But that part in uh, where my father is is thrashing Alice Day for not eating this food, that is, my father was friendly, lovely, lovable. I was probably closer to my dad than I was to my mum because Mum spent so much time with Alasdair and Alasdair was not at all interested in sports. So I was the one that went to the football matches and went climbing with dad and horse racing when we were in Weatherby. So I was probably closer to him. And with, I mean, I got the belt from him as well across my buttocks for, but I always knew what I was being punished for. And there were things that, I mean, really a child should not throw a boot brush at their mother it fortunately missed my mum and went through a window but that was wasn't very good either but it was always you wait till your father comes back so poor dad would come back tired after a day's work and have to chastise me because I'd done something wrong but and reading it now it seems cruel and abusive and but in those days I was getting the belt every day at school because of bad teaching not because I was stupid, but because the teacher was a bad teacher. And as a result, I got the belt. So this was it. Spare the rod and spoil the child was, times, was there. Absolutely. And that idea of control. And now we're much more tuned in with trauma and damage and not just physical, psychological, how that affects 
a person yes. think, but you're, yeah I mean to look back at that for many people <clears throat> you've had no experience of it I think it must seem like an alien place but for many people that was just as you said you your parents would discipline you that way schools were disciplining you that way that was just an accepted um, yes. form wasn't it so yeah um, I I never felt I never felt traumatized by it at all mm -hmm. I just accepted it I accepted I I, I the, with getting the belt at school it was because I couldn't do long division of money mm -hmm. my father I mean this is at 10 mm -hmm. And I just thought, well, whenever we stop getting taught that, then I'll stop getting the belts. My poor dad tried to teach me, but he couldn't. Yeah. Um, and it was the same. It was easier to have a slap mm -hmm. and it was done with, particularly if you knew what it was for. Mm -hmm. You know, it was done with rather than something else being worked out. But these these sections, I, I find, yeah, I found very difficult to read about. And And it's, as I said, I really got get fact and fiction muddled up at times so I will in my imagination when I'm reading the book I will embroider other happenings that are not mentioned in the book yeah of course and, and I mean, we'll pick them the sections that Alistair's written about are like any met you know any truth is a remembered version isn't it it's so it's obviously yes. altered yeah. in the process of thinking back to it and writing it and Yes, from where you were there, you know, from what happened then to where he was as, mm -hmm. as, a, as a young man writing it, it's been sort of yes. distorted or but, developed in that process too. Yes, I, I could accept, I could accept that he changed places. I mean, actually, I mean, the tenement that was absolutely as it was, and um, but for instance, the hostel was not near a loch; it was down mm -hmm. in Weatherby. I could accept the, the juxtaposition of of places, the gas fire is quite true as well. My dad, mum did have the gas fire taken out because the other person had committed suicide in it. But it was the people yeah. that I found it was it was more difficult to accept. I mean, I did talk to Alistair about it. And the, the bullying from him, I didn't look upon it as bullying, just mm -hmm. I know, just superiority. Mm -hmm. Superiority, that was it. Mm -hmm. That that did happen. And I he apologises in so many of his later le letters that he wrote to me. I'm so sorry that I bullied you when you were young, you know, this yeah. kind of thing came along. But he did steal the sugar. <laughs> he definitely did steal the sugar, but I watched him through the window. <laughs> that was absolutely true. <laughs> oh, dear. And I, oh, Sorry. So talking about you saying when you up in Glasgow, Alistair was at art school, you were studying too, and then almost you're becoming your own people at that point, yeah. and you're entering into your own lives that you were then in a way came back together and connected because you you yes. read some of the letters that you you wrote to each other over the years. Which oh. when I was looking through Alistair's items in his flat, I found that so moving. Your file was the biggest file, more of the correspondence that he saved between the two of you with lovely um like such fondness so yes yeah yeah i w i mean i reread through all his letters just uh, a couple of days ago um and they started really must have been whenever i moved from um i got married the day after i left college so that was 1958 and i stayed up in aberdeen for a few years after that but it was whenever we moved down to um stevenage in hertfordshire we got to, Bert got a job which we thought was going to be an East School Bride and it finished up in Stevenage, Hertfordshire, which why we finished down there and not in Scotland, much to my, never mind, that's another story. But <laughs> um, that was when the letters, that was when the letters started. And yes, they are, they are very, um, I enjoyed writing letters and I loved receiving them. Most of Alistair's letters starts with an apology for not replying sooner. <laughs> he found letter writing difficult because I think he felt he had to compose. He was a writer, so it had to be not yeah. just okay. the letters I would write, which worries me because a lot of the, the things that he writes about are really very personal. Yeah. So I wonder what I wrote in mine. I had no idea he was saving them oh. until it was when he was wheelchair bound and I was trying to help him tidy up some um, papers as there were always piles of papers on his desk and he said well 
that's from you, put it in your file. I couldn't, no, no. And he kept all traces, all Katrina's. And this is, I think, crumbs, what did I, what did I write? I mean, my journal can be exceedingly miserable at times because I only wrote in it when I had to get rid of angst, you know, that was a way to get rid of anything. Yeah. So I sometimes worry about what happened. Yeah, what happens with all these letters? But they were lovely, they were great. I, except some were exceedingly sad. Interesting, two that came late in 1981. I think you asked whether Alistair seemed relieved when mm -hmm. Matt ran. Yeah. I really, really sad. His, his personal life was not happy then. And financially, it was not good then. Um, so that's just a few months after Lanark was published. And I think... I, uh, yeah, sorry, carry on. Um, no. As unlikely stories came along quite quickly afterwards, didn't it? So, yeah. Just thinking about that, that determination, you know, to take 30 years to make something and, you know, to be um, stoic in your vision for it. So other people had suggested different ways or editing it or how you could make it, I guess, more commercial in a sense or more publishable, but he had this fierce sort oh. of vision and then it comes out and, you know, like anything, it's like, it's not like he then had imminent financial or other success you know he there was lots going on as you're saying and um the relief in some way of um letting that go and putting it out there but then also uh, when I was speaking in the last program with Alan Riek he was saying it was so new and so shocking in a way Lanark that almost those things are unpalatable and it takes a while for people to digest and understand just important they are it's like anything yeah. new that's not always met with um, plaudits and accolade it takes no. time for that to really filter through and you know just thinking about that how you put something like that with that emotional investment out there and um, yes. math almost of it yes you know? so do you, do you, you were at the launch um oh or, yeah. yeah yes <laughs> we used to go whenever Alistair had an exhibition or anything we'd always try to be there to be with him but uh, Bert didn't come up my husband didn't come but Tracy and I went up from Stevenage and Katrina at this time was in um, Manchester University so we met and we went we went to the launch yes I think my big joy was just seeing Andrew Katrina and Tracy all, all together and happy and their big memory would be introduced to Billy Connolly who yeah. was there and Alice Dare introduced them to Billy Connolly and their photographs taken by Billy Connolly. I mean, that was what was important to them. Have, have you seen the copy of the um, invitation? Yes. yes. I think that is abs yes. absolutely brilliant. It's, yeah. it's this a frequently announced novel by Alice Dare Gray. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Yes, we went up there. It was great. So, yeah, once again, I wrote in my journal about it. So I've, I've got that and the joy is, it was, I remember one time just standing aside and I think this happened at a lot of these later launches and things. I would just stand aside and watch everybody being animated and excited. I always felt slightly out of it, but it was, I just wanted him to be to be successful. I just wanted people to to like his work and enjoy his work, and that's been the the case all all the way, really. We went in the evening as well because there was um, Carl McDougall was mm -hmm. reading poetry in the evening at the Third Eye Centre, and again, is it all right if I go back to this of journal? Course. Of my... Such a <laughs> This is this is when Alice Dare was reading from from Lanark. Um, he chose the part from book four, where Lanark is trying to find work to provide for Rima and Alexander. It's received with great appreciation and mirth, and seems so much funnier than when I read it. This is probably why I found it was a sad book. I was too emotionally involved with it. I still don't understand all the alleg uh, allegories. But I revel in the audience's appreciation of Alice Dare's writing. And I think that was the whole thing for me, for the launch and for everything. It was the fact that all the people there were yeah. there because they they liked and they might not have appreciated totally then, but they were people who 
there were others there as friends and it was lovely seeing there were friends of my my mum and dad were there as well old friends from them friends of others days that I hadn't seen since I was we and they were coming to the house and I was banned from the bedroom where they met because I was just you know two years two years younger and a girl so <laughs> that's the way. and do you yes. have uh, Maura do you have a favorite section in Lanark that you like like I do I do I must say, I've also, as well as all Asda's letters, which I've saved, I've got now 10 volumes of cuttings. Mm. I started in 1951, wow. keeping, keeping cuttings. Number 10 is not going to get very good because Alasda used to send them to me humbly and with apologies, <laughs> but he wanted them to be kept somewhere and wow. I, I, could, I could keep them. We need to compare them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have my... Yeah, this is the book that yeah. fell through the door. Yeah, did he sign with, it for you? Oh yes. Yeah. Um, to my sister with love, hoping she likes it from Alasdair, eighth of February, nineteen eighty-one. Also with thanks for help in a difficult time. We often had difficult times financially. So, <laughs> but the bit I've chosen. And I have to warn you, I don't often get to the end without tears appearing. But it, Alice Dare also read it in a, on a, uh, a recording that he sent me. So if I don't get through it, you'll be able to hear Alice Dare reading it on Alice Dare Grey rereads that Katrina's yeah. Yeah. doing. Yeah. But it's the bit, um, it's from book four, and it's the part where uh cough there you go it's gone i was going to say where well, alasdair is is going as as the provost of unthank mm -hmm. but it of course is mr thor isn't it who's yeah. going as provost of unthank he's going to a council meeting and he's in an air aircraft of some kind and it's from there and i've chosen it because it's got description in it which i think alasdair was brilliant at and it's got memories for me he was flying up a wide and widening firth with very different coasts. To the right lay green farmland with clumps of trees and reservoirs in hollows linked by quick streams. On the left were mountain ridges and high bends silvered with snow, the sun striking gold sparks off bits of sea loch between them. On both shores, he saw summer resorts with shops, church spires and crowded esplanades and changing ports with harbours full of shipping. Tankers moved on the water and freighters and white sailed yachts. A long curving feather of smoke pointed up at him from a paddle steamer, churning with audible chunking sounds toward an island big enough to hold a grouse moor, two woods, three farms, a golf course, and a town fringing a bay. This island looked like a bright toy he could lift up off the smoothly ribbed, rippling sea, and he seemed to recognise it. He thought, did I have a sister once, and did we play together on the grassy top of that cliff among the yellow gorse bushes? Yes, on that cliff, behind the marine observatory on the day like this in the summer holidays. Did we bury a tin, sorry, under a gorse bush in a rabbit hole? There was a half crown piece in it and a silver sixpence dated from that year and a piece of our mother's jewelry and a cheap little notebook with a message to ourselves when we grew up. Did we promise to dig it up in 25 years time? And did we dig it up two days later to make sure it hadn't been stolen? And were we not children then? And was I not happy? Well, that was amazing reading to end mm. the um, podcast. It's such a privilege to talk to you and to share oh. um, and reminisce about someone um, the, yeah, who meant so much to so many, but particularly yeah. to you. So what a privilege. I 
Um, I'm saying it now because I've recorded it, but we definitely will be getting you back for more oh. the line because it is not only to have your personal take on it, but the, you know, your diaries and your letters and that kind of rich resource in terms of you, um, those memories from that time that you've got stored as well in some yeah. form. Thank you. Thank you oh, so much for joining us. Absolutely. What a privilege. Thank you, Maura. I've always felt that stories and pictures were a way of keeping people I knew alive and as they were.